Hey everyone, welcome to the SEO Vault. This is episode 77 and a really great episode today. Um, joined by special guests, new co-hosts. So thanks for tuning in. We're live on uh, Web, Tw Web 20 Ranker Facebook page and the local SEO community Facebook group. Um, as usual, I'm always joined by Mike Miles, my co-host. Today, uh, first episode, Sophie Allen joins us as co-host as well, and we'll introduce her in a little bit. And then special guest as well, Dustin Minch from Lead Kia. He's the co-founder there. Uh, he joins us. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming on. I, I, I enjoy seeing every one of you, so it's awesome. Um, all right. Howdy. Absolutely. Hey, Chaz. Yes. No, I was just saying, hey. Hey, hey. Oh. <laughs> hey, Chaz. Hey, Chaz. What's happening, Chaz, my man? I, I message Chaz that all the time. I'm just like, hey, Chaz. And then I'll forget to say something. I'll just leave it there and he'll check it like, yes. <laughs> so, so, Dustin, thanks for joining us. I know you had won a contest I, that I we did Chaz in the, the local SEO uh, Facebook community uh, or local SEO community Facebook group. You won a contest uh, uh, that we did about a month ago there. We were, took a little while to get you booked and, and get you scheduled in, but can you kind of uh, maybe tell all of the people that are going to watch this a little bit about yourself, about Lead Key? I also know you said you're into crypto real heavy. We don't want to, we don't want to veer too far off of SEO, but you right. know, mention a little of that as well. And maybe a little bit about what you're doing with your agency and, and uh, things like that. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks for having me on the show, Chaz. So yeah, I uh, we just formed a newer agency called Lead Kia. And to kind of back up, I actually, for the longest time, I've always had a strong passion to learn SEO. Um, I don't know why it was just one of those things that kind of always fascinated me where it's like, trying to figure out how to rank number one on Google, because obviously you read that, right? And you read that there's money involved in SEO, organic traffic, affiliates, stuff like that. Uh, and so four years ago, I'd, I'd actually joined a community um, called Income School. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they do a lot of blog affiliate stuff like that. And so I, I started out learning SEO from their videos and created a blog about cryptocurrency mining. And so, um, you know, you kind of had to learn fast because now you're, you know, you're writing blog posts, you're trying to format them and stuff like that. Anyways, I started doing that. And about a year and a half in, I realized that the blog stuff, it takes a while to kind of get it monetized and making money, right? Like it's, it's not like a instant gratification kind of thing where you can just, you know, write an article and page one, Google, here you go. And so in the midst of that, I was like, all right, well, I want to start getting clients. And I started dabbling into local SEO and I, you guys probably know Chase Reiner, right? Like from uh, YouTube, I started watching some of his YouTube videos and learning like the local SEO game. Right. And out of all that, somehow I actually, uh, cause I started getting clients before I even really knew what I was doing. So that, that was great. Right. <laughs> like, cool. I got the client part. Now I just got to figure out what to do. Right. Good problem to have. Um, and you know, after doing so much research, I finally bumped into your guys' uh, local client takeover, right? And uh, the reason why I mention this is because it's probably one of the most powerful resources I've ever watched. And if, if anybody's watching this, the course that Chaz has on local client takeover is probably the best and it's free, doesn't cost you any money, right? And, um, you know, the fact that you took the time to actually read the Google patents and study all that stuff really meant something to me anyways. Um, so we've grown into an agency and, you know, thank God we landed on your services because it really allows us to like not have to worry about the fulfillment part, right? Just focus on getting clients, throw them behind you, make sure you answer the phone, answer any questions they have and let web 20 ranker do the rest. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for that plug, by the way. That's awesome. Uh, for the <laughs> training and the, the service. Uh, but One promotion we right. don't have to do. Um, it's awesome. Right. So, so anyways, um, you know, kind of where we're at in our agency, we are growing. We do have 25 clients and we like doing the local client stuff, but 
what we also noticed is the blog affiliate stuff is it's powerful, right? But it's a longer term play. And so we're kind of at this unique crossroads in our agency where it's like, do we want to take on more clients and just run them through the, you know, we call the subway station that Web20 Ranker has, right? We could do that, right? Or we maybe we find four or five more profitable niches and start building, taking some of the agency money and building out these bigger websites that are a longer term money play. But then you don't have any client, you are the client at that point. So if you want to go on vacation for six months, you can do that. So anyways, I don't know where I was going with that, but that's kind of where we're at in our agency is like, do we want more clients or, and, you know, make money that way? Or do we want to start building more, you know, kind of like the crypto miner tips website that's taken off? Do we want to build more of those? Um, and I don't, you know, like I said, I don't know where I was going else with that, but um, that's kind of like my segue into, you know, where we're at as an agency and stuff like that. So that is, that's, a, that's a good conundrum to be at though, right? You have a nice handful of clients. You have some, some assets that you're building yourself, which is always a good thing to do. Um, uh, man, that's, that's, a good, that's a good problem to be, at, to be having right now. So um, I want to class it. High class problems, man. It's high class problems always. Exactly, right? Right. But, I do. I am a big fan of building some of your own assets and controlling some of your own assets. Um, but I am I, not I, a fan I, of client I, SEO personally. What's that? I'm, I'm not a fan of client SEO personally. I, I wanted to get out of that like the first year or two I got into it. Well, here's, <laughs> it like here's, here's the thing with it. When you have a client, you're building their asset, mm -hmm. right? And so like I always tell the client, like if you fire me tomorrow you still have an asset that I worked on. That's going to, you know, if you let me work on it for a while, it's potentially going to generate income for you for years to come. And so you really have to think at a certain point, is my time better spent on building other people's assets or is my time better spent building my own money-making assets? Right. It's kind of like, I got this blank canvas. It's like, what do I want to do? Which way do I, you know, I can make money in either direction. So which direction do I want to go in? Right. Um, but yeah. It's an interesting you, problem to have. Have you niched down in your agency? Have you have you chosen a niche or a couple of niches, or are you more of a generalist? Or so we, I was. I'm on the. You know, I know that there's power in niching down, right? And choosing your niche because you can create a unique message that speaks to a unique audience and get more of that audience, right? Um, but with the SEO stuff, I learned that I wanted to try a lot of different things because you don't really know what you like until you get into it. And I think some people, they just choose a niche like, Hey, I'll go after chiropractors because they're going to pay me the most money. But maybe chiropractors are like the worst people to talk to on the phone and do business with. Right. So like we wanted to try it all. We've been dabbling a lot into like the, the, the what has me really interested is these CBD stores. Um, because man, I'll tell you what, if you can start I mean, we, we, we've even built some e-com stores and they got local traffic going into that Shopify store through Google, my business, and they're ordering products online. So it's like, dude, the site's been live and you made $8,000 in sales. So that's really, really interesting. The other thing is like the, um, we've been thinking a lot about like the restoration, the water damage, the mold remediation stuff, just because it is kind of a unique niche. Uh, you know, one client for a water damage could be potentially worth a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So you get that client one phone call. Um, and I've learned this from Ross Christopoli is like, you want to be in a niche where you could tell the client, all it takes is for me to get the phone to ring one time that month and your, your marketing's paid for, right? If I could bring you a hundred thousand dollar client, that 1500 or $3,000 or whatever I'm charging you is a drop in the bucket. Right. Um, Whereas That's like, a good point. That's a good yeah, point. where in the, you know, like I'll give you a bad example, the handyman niche. I got a test server for the handyman niche. So if you ever guys want to burn it up, Mike, go for it. But, um, you know, you Plumbers have to bring on that category too. Plumbers yeah. You got to get them. One. It's <laughs> like, you got to get them like 10 clients a month just for the marketing to pay for itself. It doesn't really make sense in that niche to do that. Right. Um, so we, that's kind of where we've been heading is, you know, either restoration or, just going full blown CBD and, and targeting some of these CBD stores. Cause that, that is a booming industry. It is starting to erupt. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in that. So. Yeah. And that's interesting about, uh, setting up their e com store as well and, and putting that as part of the local, like, that's really cool. That's interesting. Um, 
awesome stuff. Well, thank you for joining us. That's really cool. And thanks for sharing your story with us. Um, thank you. Uh, now, I want to I want to segue a little and introduce Sophie for everybody. Um, so Sophie Allen, uh, Sophie's our sales manager uh, at Local Brand Advisor. She manages the sales and setting up uh, automations and some really cool systems and processes. So having her on uh, the show, um, probably not this episode, but in future episodes, we'll actually have maybe like a little agency tip session or something where we talk about some of the processes or sales. Um, we have a really strong component for local SEO on this show. So we're, we're going to add some agency stuff to it as well. And so Sophie, thanks for coming on. You want to say, tell everybody a little bit about you, a little bit about your background. Um, you have a lot of experience in digital marketing and kind of introduce some people that don't know you. Yeah. So I've done SEO for almost, oh, I'm 27 now, so six years. And I started doing sales first, like selling other stuff. And then there's not a lot of SEOs that want to do sales. So it's kind of a nice situation to be in because there's not as much competition. There's a lot of SEOs out there, but there's not as many SEO salespeople. So I like it. And I like the systems part of it is almost my favorite. Now I'm becoming a high level expert. So that's cool. But there's a lot of systems involved. So that's fun to build. They're like your processes are great, by the way. Like I saw some of the mind maps that you made with oh, yeah. uh, the pipelines and the lead flow, really, really great stuff. And for anybody watching, uh, we are going to have that, uh, the agency growth um, webby coming up uh, where we show all the high level systems and process that we are setting up. Uh, one of the main people setting that up is Sophie, right? Sophie's setting up, Mike's very involved. Bucky's also very involved. I'm not very involved. Um, they're doing all the, the, the thinking and the, the really technical stuff. So make sure anybody that's not signed up to join that Webby, that's March 10th at 2 p.m., uh, the registration link has been going around in the weekend update email that you can get on at web20ranker.com. We have an archive of all the old emails. Go there, register. It's free. You don't have to pay. Just register so you can see the archives. Get in there. Sign up on that link, right? Um, it's that way you can see some of these systems and what is capable of managing lead flow um, and, and just really automating uh, your marketing messaging uh, to, to a high level, right? At a high level, so. <laughs> yeah. No pun intended. This is great. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's been a pretty productive week. Been uh, starting some new tests today with the CP, uh, CPA, uh, C CTR. <laughs> CPA for the accounting test. Accounting. So yes, the CTR booster. So that's fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some new GMB tests are going to be coming out. We are testing some engagement stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. We'll see how that works. What about some, uh, what would what, you test last week, Mike? You want to just segue into the SEO mad scientist? Yeah, I guess that works. Last week we were looking at questions and answers um specifically on both individually does adding a question with any keywords or anything do anything or is adding an answer uh with any keywords or similar do anything uh the the question itself didn't seem to move anything at all the answer looked like there may have been some initial movement we're obviously going to return to that uh this weekend and do another follow-up but definitely nothing major that we're seeing similar to a lot of the other signals um, that we've looked at like posts and things. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was, Absolutely. uh, all right. So Q and A's eh, probably best practice, but don't expect them to like boost that needle for you. If you need that needle to move. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I do. So, so I was thinking even a little bit deeper, um, about just like GMB in general. Uh, I did a little training. I did actually did a couple of trainings the last couple of days, and some of the stuff that I was like exploring, a, a lot of this content and, and stuff that we're adding to the GMB individually, it, it does, it's, it's really meaningless, right? It, it, individually, you don't really see anything, but I do, I am of the opinion that you should still probably do it 
Because if even though individually it doesn't do anything, if Google does parse any of that content and looking for, you know, triples or co-occurrence or anything like that, or they're taking like the semantic meaning of it and putting it with the entity. I mean, I still see it as being potentially valuable to do. Um, not so, not so much to push rank, but to just push relevance for the brand, push, um, push related terms, right? Uh, make sure your brand semantically related to the, to the concepts that it should be. So the more concepts and data you put out about your brand surrounding it, um, you know, not only just in your GMB listing, but data in general, I think that is that it's more beneficial than not, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm of the opinion that a lot of the stuff does function kind of similarly, like what we saw with uh, services. Um, again, not going to rank you, but it could potentially um, make you relevant for something that you weren't relevant for before. But um, I don't know. What do you think? Am I way off base? Anybody? Um We've with our previous tests, we have so it's kind of hard to test that right because of all the variables and like you test it all together. But we have seen with listings that we've done more of that on listing optimization that showed some rankings when we would pull that off. We did see ranking losses, so I, I definitely think there's a probably a connection between the, the signals that you put on the listing as well as what Google finds across the internet as a whole, right? So it kind of looks for a like to verify what you tell it directly on the listing. Um, and I think when those things line up, you can see results. And when you pull either end away, you can lose those results. Uh, but yeah, just putting up a listing and doing optimization on the listing alone, I don't think gets you that far. Uh, but I do think as part of the big picture, like you said, it's, it is pretty important because, um, we've seen, we've seen the drops when we pull the stuff out, when we are ranking. So there's, there's always that side to it. Okay. Absolutely. Um, GMB update. You know what? There was something I was looking at. Oh, <clears throat> so I, I ran into a weird situation with a GMB the other day or well, a bunch of GMBs. <clears throat> I just realized me and, you know, maybe you already know that anybody watching, maybe you already know this, but if you are ever in a situation with a GMB listing where somebody else is the primary owner and you can at least get regular owner access, you can go oh, in yeah. now and you can actually switch, switch to it. primary owner and switch everything around. And I, I, I could have sworn that wasn't available the last time I went in to do that. Was that always available or? As far as I know, because not like I've ever sold fake GMBs or anything, but that's how you push them to someone else's account. <laughs> so, <laughs> gotcha. For the record, never did that. Never, never did, did it, but I know that's how they do it when they push them to other accounts. So, but it, so it wasn't the primary. So they have the primary owner, the owner, then some manager stuff. Yeah. So it was that actually the owner account. Mm -hmm. I didn't have access to the primary owner account. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So like I've had people push GMBs to me and make me an owner and then I sign in and make myself the primary owner and then delete them from the account. That's weird. So maybe I've, I've bought a few GMBs in my time. I've we'll never there. had to go in and make that transition the other way. I always went from primary to adding other owners or something. I never had to go the so other Kaz way. was always the seller, not the seller. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. he's the GMB dealer. <laughs> yeah. We have some, oh, some comments here. Yeah, uh, there's sorry. actually quite a few comments. Yeah, I was just. Um, Matt's blowing it up in here. Mr. Matt, Matt says, Stack. No, uh, Meg uh, uh He said, great story, uh, Dustin. Um, let me just look at some of these comments. One of the good ones, he said how he gave a client a proposal and told him to go with another company and they went with him, which is kind of like a mind trick that like I've, I've noticed I've done it in the past where it's just like you know I would just go with them if you're not sure like you know if you have to think about it that much maybe we're not a good fit and then they're like oh maybe maybe he is too good for me and maybe I want that or something you know what I mean <laughs> I, I want to piggyback off that because that's kind of how you have to play because like some of these people spinning up agencies they're like I need this client and I get them on the phone and I'm just like I don't think you're a good fit for what we offer because like 
I'm looking for a particular personality type of person that I know is going to be low maintenance, easy on me. Just as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, they're going to keep paying. Right. And you can kind of tell when you get on the phone, if they're, you know, worried about this, that, and the other, but, um, you know, that that's called a, we call it a pullback in the sales world where you'd be like, you know what? I don't think I'm a good fit for you. You know, you probably want to go with another company. And then they're just like, well, wait a minute. I want to be a good fit for your company. You know what I mean? At that point, like, they, they, they want to force the issue is like, I, I think I am a good fit for this. Right. So just to piggyback on that too. Sorry. I think Sylvia was about to say something, but real quick yesterday, I was on a sales call with someone for a web design situation. Um, and it was kind of the same thing where, they, they looked at my situation. They, they told me their quote, $7,500, immediately said they would go down to 5,000. And then when I got off the call, they sent me more information because I asked them to send me information and they took another 500 off the price. Never once did I tell them their pricing was too high or comment on it or anything. And I, I know like how much like some of these site designs and things cost, you know, like 7,500 for a certain site design isn't out of the question. If you would have just said that, and not left that like I wouldn't have quite I wouldn't have questioned it I wouldn't but now I'm at 4,500 and I'm thinking man I could probably get him down to 3k if he's gonna just keep dropping yeah like you gotta price. act like it's an act of God to drop the price and yeah. usually I'll start taking things away like hey I'll do it at that price but I'm only gonna do this this and this it's always a bartering chip yeah I don't need the business if it's not gonna be what you know what's gonna work so yeah that's again same same concept so I was watching a, a, a sales training uh, yesterday or the day before. I think I had shared it. And the guy was talking about the same thing. Like if you're offering, if you have, if you have packages, if you, if you have options, only offer one at a time. Don't offer the one price. And only if they say no to that price, you offer the lower one, right? Um, <laughs> so interesting, interesting it's I, 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 I can actually attest to that. Like having just one offer is probably best, right? Because you give them, if you give them too much data there, and then they got to think about which one they want. They're like, this is a lot to think about. Let me think about this and I'll get back to you. Whereas if you just have one offer, it's like, what's the thing about this is all I offer. This is what you get. Right. Kind the, of thing. the only time I've had good uh, with two offers is when I have, like a base offer and then like the premium offer, but I price them the same and kind of use it as a, a, a like time sensitive incentive to say, Hey, look, we're actually running this or this right now, where if you get this package today, we'll, you know, do that for the same price, which also has worked uh, the same, but you kind of treat that as like, we set this up before we even talk to you kind of thing. Not yeah. like I'm dropping the price just for you you know, and like, I need the business, like, this is just what we're doing. But that's, that's the time I've seen that work too. It does sound real false though. It doesn't like, if you come with one price then suddenly you can be like, well, I'm going to drop it to this one. I'll drop it even. So how much is it? Why'd you give me the first price in the first place? Like, what are you trying to do? What if I would have said, yes, you're just going to, what are you doing with all that extra money? Like, isn't that going into my campaign or right? You just told me it's not worth that price by dropping it. That's what you told me. Yeah. That's very, (laughs) very good stuff. All right. So Sophie, um, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I sold a client like a $4,000 package yesterday. And the girl I work with was like, oh, let's give them all these options. And I'm like, no, you're confusing. You're going to confuse them. This is just, she runs her own, like a, it's a holiday event and they're not marketers. And so I gave her one option and she's like, yes. Okay. Like it was like, it was immediate. She said yes. Whereas if, when I give them options, they're like, well, what do I do? Which do I choose? How do I decide which ad size I'm going to do? We know that working at web 20, look at how many options we have and how many questions we get. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a constant challenge over at web 20 is it's, not having too many options. It's rumor it's- has it though. You guys are starting to work on being more descriptive for each service. So people have a little bit more to like nibble on. I was talking with Bucky. I was like, you know, oh. sometimes just even a video of what this one service will do, even if it's a minute long, like, Hey, buy this when you're experiencing this, this, and this, right? Um, it's on our list to have all those videos done soon. I'll, we'll get them. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of videos, I will, though, because I've been, re, I've been ra- working on those service pages. 
Well, and I will admit, if you're just brand new to Web20 and you go into that menu, it can be like very daunting to like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like, what is all this stuff? And that's why I always put in, you know, tell people like you got to watch Chaz's training because it really piggybacks off of all those services and kind of explains it, which is funny because it's like you show people how to do it. But in the video, too, they come to realization that I don't have to do this. I can just buy it through Chaz. Right. <laughs> like, why am I going to sit there and spin up, you know, 300 directories? Name, a slight whatever, marketing email. angle to it. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Just a little. Yeah. It's like he builds it up and then he puts the plug right there. He's like, hey, you could do this. But then I have a button right here that it does it for you, too, as well. And it's like, I'll take option B, <laughs> you know. Unless you don't got the money, then you do it yourself until you got the money and then you start paying. Someone. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're going to have to do whatever you got to do to, you know, when you're first starting out, but absolutely. All right. After a while, you don't have to live like that anymore. You can just white label it, you know? Yeah. It's better to have the understanding though. I like it. Like in the beginning when I had to do everything myself, then I have a working knowledge at least. Yep. So much better at sales when you've done SEO versus not ever doing it trying to sell it there's no way you could sell it if you don't do i mean i guess a lot of people do that's well, why everyone's been burned you can bullshit a lot of people through a sale so you don't really need to i wouldn't i wouldn't say you need to know something to sell it yeah but then you can't deliver like i have so many clients that, who were burned in the past because somebody <laughs> threw out some big words and they it were looks like the expectations yeah oh, we'll get well, you a page one no problem and that's what I, I this is why I, I kind of like the uh, this this realm of, you know, kind of growing an agency and stuff like that, because I come from the the door to door sales world selling solar systems door to door. Did that for six years, highly successful. But um, I noticed that the bar is kind of set low in the SEO world where there's some people out there that have an agency and it's like they're still using 2010 SEO tactics and they still somehow get clients. But it's not like consistent results, right? And so, like, I see that as an opportunity to kind of be do something special because it's it is something that if you're not actively continuing to learn new stuff day in and day out, like it's not like Chaz gets to a moment in his life and he wakes up, I've made it, I know everything there is to know about SEO, I'm done learning, right? Like, you don't need to grow the company anymore. Every day I gotta learn some new stuff, it seems. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you constantly have to be on this wheelhouse of learning new stuff, doing new tests to stay on the cutting edge of that. And to me, it keeps a lot of the, the riff raft out. But I say for every one good SEO agency, there's probably a thousand bad ones out there that just, I don't know what they're doing. It's like voodoo almost is what they're trying to do on the SEO voodoo. <laughs> yeah, I just think in my opinion, I just think, you know, people get caught up in the make money online scene sometimes and they see that this is a route into it and they but they've never taken their time to actually build any of their own properties and rank anything of their own and and they kind of get in with like uh you know they're, they're not ready for the when they actually have to then go rank stuff and right you know, uh, it's you know reading about it and actually going and doing it's two different things you know you can read like Moz or some or lct train whatever right reading about it but when you actually have to go and like build a, a location page and then go do interlinking and build signals for all of it like it's like right. oh okay you know you start understanding a lot better and um, or you get a client that already has seo and you have to undo the knot that somebody else made and you don't know what to look for right and you're like why isn't this thing ranking and it's something that you're not even checking right um yeah it's uh oh well hopefully that's why we have this show and training at LCT and awesome <laughs> posts at Web20 for agencies that are newer and developing. We have lots of resources. Free and recommendations. Free recommendations. So, products, yeah. you know, if, if you are struggling for fulfillment or make, getting results, you know. Or the SEO vault. Ask your questions right now in the comments. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Let me get. Well, and that's the, the one thing I want to say, and I'll shut up. Cause I talk <laughs> a lot. I know I'll, I'll shut up. You're the guest. Um, it's all yours. You know, there is, you, you, you were mentioning about how you can go to Moz and stuff and get this information, but 
there's a lot of the, the issue with learning it is there's a lot of fluff information that you have to sift through. Like you have to dig to find Chaz's course on all that, where it gets really, really granular. And there's just so much like blanket information about Google, my business, like, Oh, this is Google, my business. You fill this out, get a postcard, right? Like it's just generic information. Um, and so like, the learning curve to get to the good. I mean, it just, you have to be really hunting just to land on your website to find the right information. That's going to actually move the needle because you read Moz, you read search engine journal, all this stuff. You do some of the things that they're mentioning and it don't work, right? You don't get any results. And then, you know, you start looking at things differently, start really hunting for that information and start using some of the tactics that you guys use. And next thing you know, you have something that's like moving the needle, but uh, there's not a lot of good GMB educational materials out there on that stuff. Like it's, you know, there's only a, you're literally your community is one of the best resources for what moves the needle inside of GMB. So when I see other people like, Oh, I'm gonna learn from this guy. I'm learn from that guy. It's like, I start laughing a little bit because it's like, you're in for a long road of just hurt and pain and banging your head against the wall and not, you know, stuff that doesn't work. Right. I, I found um, like a lot of the free knowledge out there on GMB is, is a little questionable or outdated. Maybe uh, it's there. There are some good paid courses, but you have to pay and dig. Like you said, Doug, you got to dig and pay. You know, there's some really good ones. Like, you know, Verstag has a great one. Uh, Brian Willie, obviously like some of those, but you got to pay to get it. And, it's if you just like you you know if you go to some of those big industry journals a lot of them are pushing more of like very very white hat um not that i'm not do white hat stuff but like they don't even look outside the box at all on signal creation or you know um it's it's well, and they're like, like just order citations but they don't tell you what kind of citations to order and in a lot of these citation services it's just the same old run of the mill i think they all use the same tool and you know kind of to your point they blast the same information the same business description they'll use it 300 times over and they're like sweet i ordered 300 citations the client's good to go but then you look and 20 of them indexed right you didn't order 300, you ordered, you got, you ordered 300, but you only got 20, right? Because 20 are indexed. And so like this stuff like that, the, the real granular stuff that there's just not a lot of people teaching out there. Right. Um, and, and that's the information that's hard to get. Just like questionable info. I saw that too. And I, I try not to make too much mention of it anymore. Cause it makes you enemies in the industry. <laughs> um, a lot of drama. Yeah, so I try to shut up, but you know, like a lot you see, like the ranking for GMB, a lot of people are like, oh, rev GMB reviews. It's like, really? Like, they're not that strong. Like, if that's your tactic, like, okay, like, yay, citation yeah. GMB reviews, right? That's <laughs> like, that's I, pretty much get reviews. It's, it's definitely good for CTR, but from like a ranking signal, it's like, come on, there's there's other stuff that move the needle a lot better. But, mm -hmm. um, but saying that, uh, let me do a, a quick update of the, some of the brand stuff. Uh, I do want, you know what? I do want to announce anybody watching, this is a good time to maybe do an update while we're talking all this local stuff. Well, Mike, you know what? Let's, let's finish and tell people what your GMB test this week's going to look at. Yeah. So this week we're doing the follow-up on the Q and A. Uh, and then we're also testing some of the outbound links. I think I mentioned like one or two tests ago, there's, you know, the website appointment links, uh, and then some, some special links too, depending on what categories you choose, uh, which is why we initially did our category tests uh, a month back or so. So we're going to dig into those links and see how those play a part in, in what happens when you link to certain content. Awesome. And for anybody watching that, those tests go out uh, Friday, somewhere around lunchtime, the email goes out. It's an email. It's a weekend email. You sign up at web20ranker.com. Um, there's multiple places just under knowledge in the drop down. go to uh, uh, the weekend update and sign up right there. It'll get you on the list. Um, but Mike publishes this stuff just about every week. He's either a new test or a test update. Um, and like you, like you heard him say, there's some, there's some big tests in the works right now with things like engagement, 
We're testing real engagement. We're testing software stuff, right? Um, so we're, we'll be we'll be releasing all of it. We don't charge for the test results. They're all it's it's what we use internally to judge what's moving the needle on our own campaigns at Web Twenty. That we you know that we we constantly refresh the campaigns and packages there. Um, and it's based on test results. What, what's moving the needle? What's working really well? Example again, a great segue is we just updated our uh, our SEO campaigns, our white label SEO campaigns, the fully managed ones. Completely redid those packages, re reworked the links. Uh, we're getting Google News links now. We're getting high traffic guest posts, all standard in those. Um, so rework those. Go check them out. Web twenty. Um, Mike just recently got the final edits done on uh, a link metric blog post really dives into what links or what link metrics matter, what link metrics don't matter, um, what we should be looking at. And I know Mike had just recently finished some final edits on that. Sophie actually uh, wrote that, by the way, that yeah. was one of Sophie's posts. But I just, then Mueller says back the number of backlinks don't matter. You see that recently? Yeah. yeah. I had to mention, I had to kick the hornet's nest on that one. I was like, wait a minute, the number of backlinks don't matter anymore. Okay. I'll bite. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> in, in certain ways, I think he doesn't really lie, but he just, in, he doesn't ever, I don't think they ever give you the full. It, it goes back to your theory. It depends, right? It's yeah. always, it depends. Well, I think apparently so. that's how it always goes you know yeah. <laughs> it depends yeah but i mean if you're building links though go check that metric post out it's the new one of the newest blog posts on web 20 um it'll help you make sure that you're landing quality links all the time it'll help you identify what to look for and what to ignore there's so much misinformation when it comes to links and link quality and metrics um I'm finally glad we got this post live and, and published because it's going to help solve. We have, we get questions all the time. We sell a lot of links at Web20, everything from guest posts, niche edits to PBNs. Um, we sell a lot, but we get lots of questions. We get lots of people that come in looking for the wrong metrics too, where, you know, if people might still be thinking about uh, domain authority or page authority wrong, right? Those third party metrics. Um, we kind of dive into all that stuff. So I still see some people talking about page rank, page. like the actual number, like yeah. they, they're wanting links from like a PR seven website. Like, yeah. So, yeah. That's, oh. <laughs> That's so, so what's the, what's the theory behind it? Like they want to the they're paying more concerned with like the domain authority of the website that they get the link from then the num yeah the numbers that third party metrics give them usually is, is like yeah. the trust flow the da which and i think a lot of it just comes from confusion of terms and huh. as terms change and get used in the industry i think that creates confusion like example would be the pr right somebody that says i want a pr7 link well maybe a couple of years ago when they published and let you know the pr of pages and way more than a couple now yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the concept of PR still applies, but you just don't know what, what it is. You don't you don't know what that number is. You don't even know if they're using numbers or have they evolved it now. Um, the, the concept still applies, but the metric as a metric, it doesn't. Right. I mean, it's not a metric you can weigh. Um, so, so this post helps clear a lot of that stuff up, like the, the confusion between like a, a, a website's authority of their backlink graph. Like if you say something that is like an authoritative backlink graph, it definitely is not the same as saying it's has a high domain authority. Like there's the, the, the terms got misconstrued and, you know, people are using terms as like services now, you know, like, you know, um, the third party metrics and stuff. And it, I think this post really clears a lot of that up. So, um, but that's live. Uh, what else? Um, I, I mentioned the Webby, uh, the free Webby. It's open. Go sign up. It will be coming out in the weekend update again. Um, already, uh, I had to already expand the Zoom webinar capacity. 
because uh, we had reached our initial limit. Uh, we're beyond that now. We're on the next tier. So we'll see if we fill that one up. It's still a few weeks away. So we might fill, we might have a lot of people on that uh, Webby. So check that out. Um, what else? Uh, you doing a GMB masterclass again? Like there isn't there another like layer of course that you have material? I was curious to know when that's coming out. Uh, so um, what there is, is there's going to be a private webby for like agency growth stuff okay. beyond the one that we're doing with high level. There's going to be one where we actually go and show an actual sales systems too that we're using um, to funnel the traffic and stuff like that. So the high level free webby, we're showing high level and how we set that up and what that the capabilities that can bring to um, you know marketing automation basically um, the other webby the closed one that was accessed through some of the sales and some of the promotions that we ran and there's probably still going to be a, another chance or two to get into those over a weekend maybe next week or the week after um, that's going to actually open up and you know we're showing high level in one the other one's just going to show everything like okay what are we doing for cold email? What are we doing for uh, outbound, inbound ads, uh, lists, right? We, we really opened up at a higher level or a more in-depth level, I guess, um, and reveal more of the back end. This is stuff, again, this is stuff that's in, in it's not been set up just for examples. It's, it's in use. It's actual, we're using these things. We're, we're, we're generating traffic appointments leads etc so have you guys have you guys merged your or migrated over to go high level for your your client acquisition as of recently and been testing it for client acquisition so with high level where we're at in it um high level we're setting up a lot of our um so inbound leads cold inbound. So people calling in is going to go to high level and it's going to go into the pipelines there. Nice. And then um, cold outbound. So things that were setting us, uh, things that were leads that we're getting from, you know, uh, like our cold calling campaigns, our cold email campaigns that we initiate, those are also going to uh, be pipelining through high level. A lot of the follow-up stuff isn't going to be in there or it, that's more of a long-term getting that stuff in. This is the initial, the, the cold leads and how we're going to manage that in high level. So that right. initial cold lead is going to be in high level. And we're doing it for, Sophie's doing high level for local brand advisor, Sophie and Mike. Um, and Bucky and Mike are doing it for Web20. So Web20, you know, we're going to have, we're, we're revamping um, the whole cold traffic there as well. Um, how that works. We've, we've listened to our agencies that have told us like, hey, it's confusing when we first come to you. There, there's going to be whole new uh, systems put into place to help alleviate some of that, help streamline the new agencies. Um, basically, the leads that come in help streamline them to help them make better decisions, understand our tech stack that's available to them a little bit better, and just work those leads at uh, a little bit more of a professional level than what we were previously. Um, so right. that's what that's what we're setting up right now is that cold stuff. Eventually, we'll put more into it, um, but that's, one thing at a time. So. That's what I'm kind of looking to do is get my go high level set up where I'm blasting out cold email. It's pulling in those responses, and I could start you know doing the automation and the follow up with that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I was kind of asking you guys because I'd be definitely interested in figuring out. Uh, there's just the power of go high level right now is insane compared to other platforms. In my opinion, like just, there's so much stuff that you can do. Um, but I, you know, there's, a. I honestly think that there's a strong need for somebody to develop some kind of client acquisition for SEO leads, right. That, to get more, more clients, right. On go high level. So there's not, I don't see a lot of people really focusing on the, the SEO stuff. They're more trying to go after like you know, businesses to run Facebook ads for. Um, but I do think that you can uh, probably do some, I mean, get a whole boatload of clients setting up automation and having go high level, do your cold, e your cold outreach for you. Right. Um, I just think that, you know, there's not a lot of whole people, a lot of, 
there's not a lot of people utilizing the tool like that to get SEO clients. Um, so I, like I said, I'd be super, super interested to kind of see how you guys set that up. Um, because one of the best ways I found to get clients is I, I blast out 500 emails a day, right? And see who responds back, but I have to do that manually. But apparently there's a way I can set that up, import that list and go high level where it'll automatically send out those emails and then pull in the leads that respond back and yeah. hit them with automation and nurture them into booking a call. Right. Um, they even have an app where like, if your lead texts you or emails you back, you get a notification. Cause like I've gotten one since we've been on the call. Yeah, it does. I mean, there's the power of that platform is it can be overwhelming when you first get in there. Cause it's like, you just go cross-eyed with everything that you can do. Um, Oh, the first day was so frustrating. I'm just like, <laughs> what am I even supposed to be doing? But now it's it's really, really cool, honestly. The the whole pipeline, you can automate everything from like start to yeah. finish. You don't really even have to touch it once you get the leads in there, which I like. Well, and if you do it right, that, that client cannot tell whether the bot's texting them or you're texting them at a certain point. If you set it up just right, it should feel like a human is talking to them. And then you can kind of like, see the thread, see the conversation and then piggyback off that and segue in yourself where now you're talking to them, but they don't know in their mind the difference between what the bot was saying to them and what you're saying to them. Yeah. Which is huge. I like a lot, of, like ever since I started using high level, it's helped me identify kinks in our funnel to where people are falling off. You know, you can see a trend of like 80% of the people are falling off here Well, we need a new campaign sequence or whatever. So I like that. It's way better than any email platform I've ever used, which is nice. Well, and I, I think onboarding is like the most important, one of the most important things to focus on in your agency is how do you onboard a client? And if it's clunky and you don't have all this stuff set up, the client can start second guessing your uh, ability to do work, right? Um, so like just being able to have like a clear runway for those type of people. Cause there's some people that are just going to want it. They want to, they want a clear path to just bulldoze their way through it and get onboarded. Right. There's going to be other people that you kind of have to nurture, get on the phone and, you know, talk to them a little bit more to, to get them to do business with you. So, uh, you know, onboarding is, you know, it's important if you want it to be able to take on a lot of clients because you don't want your onboarding process to take, three hours, right? Uh, first of all, the client's going to be fed up with you, probably just mad, right? So again, I'll be, you know, I don't know if you guys are going to be, it sounds like you're going to turn that into a webinar then, Chaz, for the, the go high level stuff at some point. Well, we have the free one, uh, the, the open webinar that's scheduled for March 10th. Okay. Um, that's where we're going to show everything we did in high level and set everything that's set up and how some of those pipelines and stuff work in the flows. And then we'll, we'll, we're still waiting to announce the date of, of the other Webby, um, but that's coming soon as well. So cool. awesome. Um, all right. This is, this is turning into a really great episode. We also, I, I apologize for anybody that is commenting and we're missing them um, because we're, we're in this conversation. So I do cop um, uh, but we had a ton of comments uh, yeah. on this episode. So thanks for everybody that's tuned in with us. Um, Mike, you want to go ahead and run through news? Yeah, let's run through it real quick. Um, some, some good updates here, nothing major. Um, first of all, let us know if you've seen any shaking in the SERPs or anything. There's been some chatter about SEO updates as usual, um, nothing major from what I've seen, but we always like to hear from everyone else if they're seeing anything in particular. So other than that, um, recently on Search Off the Record podcast with John Mueller, Gary, and Martin, uh, they were talking about the serving index and index shards. I believe we've talked a little bit about this on previous vault. Um, it's a pretty interesting um, uh, session to watch with them. Uh, going into specifically how they kind of tokenize the data and break it up. We've discussed this on the vault before, but understanding how Google index things, how they serve up the index uh, versus just, it, it's not as simple as they just crawl your page and like put everything on a server and then like track keywords and things like that. It's, it's actually a really complex process. So um, look into more of that if you are interested more in the technical side. 
indexation is obviously an important part of SEO. Uh, Google mobile first indexing. Um, John Mueller said that is most likely coming out in March this year. We recently had heard them move it from last September. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's guaranteed though. John kind of said we're expecting it around March. So we could see another push off aside from that. In the Google Search Council, Google Association Controls uh, updated. Honestly, I'm not sure if these were there before. I've never actually dug into them. I believe they were linking like your Google Analytics to your Search Council. Um, but there's multiple properties in there now where you can kind of connect all these properties from Google Analytics, Search Council, Google Ads, YouTube, Play Council, uh, Actions Council, and Chrome Web Store account. Pretty much linking your brand for say if you're looking at analytics, seeing what more people are actually searching for instead of having all the hidden searches. Uh, and then also kind of the relation to search on YouTube and your apps or whatever else you have going on. So that is in your search council under settings. Uh, there's a section called associations. Go check that out if you haven't already. Uh, let's see here. <coughs> Excuse me. The page experience update. Uh, in March is said to not have a major impact, um, probably similar to what we're seeing right now with the passage uh, update. Google seems to be kind of slowly wanting to push out these updates or not really shaking up the SERPs like they used to, probably because they get a lot of kickback when that happens. So when the, the page experience comes out, uh, don't expect to see massive movement, but over time you will probably see things occurring. So if you are in a position where that is released and you start seeing some slow ranking drops, things like that. Be aware that might be the case. Uh, lastly, in just the general news, Google has, uh, there's been some reports of Google showing less featured snippets, uh, specifically on Mozcast and some other platforms. So if you are uh, ranking for a lot of featured snippets, you may wanna go kind of check that, see what those SERPs look like. There might be uh, some changes there, but there also may, there's, there's some talks of it possibly just being a little bug. So maybe those will come back shortly. Who knows? Uh, other than that, we have some fun little Google says comments here that I want to throw out because some of them are just absolutely ridiculous. And then some of them actually have some good insight. So first of all, John Mueller commenting on number of backlinks mm -hmm. uh, to a page or website being absolutely irrelevant for SEO. Uh, probably mm -hmm. not true from what I've seen. John Mueller also saying that uh, no search penalty for too many redirects. So if you're redirecting to a page, to another page, to another page, that is not something that Google looks at uh, as a negative signal. Um, Google also, John Mueller said, doesn't announce depreciated ranking signals, meaning if they stop looking at something or using something, they, they don't really talk about um, things that have dropped in the algo. Uh, and then we have two comments here from Gary Eilis. Um, one, talking about Google making adjustments in their algorithm due to SEOs, specifically was saying that he only thinks there's about four or five times that Google has made algorithm shifts due to SEOs um, manipulating the search engine, which I figured would probably be a little bit higher, but maybe uh, like Penguin and Panda, I think are probably ones that he's referring to, but I don't know what what updates do you think they made because of SEOs. I have a feeling it's more than four or five in ten years. Uh, let's see. He also says that title tags longer than Google shows in the SERPs get SEO value. I actually can't remember if I did that test on the SEO Mad Scientist or previously, but I know I've done metadata tests where keywords not showing in the SERPs and metadata still produce rankings and relevance. So uh, be aware of that if you didn't know. And finally, uh, Google made a comment about there's no reason to make a bloated site, specifically in reference to cooking sites, which I did mention on a, re a previous vault, how uh, when you go look up recipes online, you get like the seven page, uh, you know, content pack of their backstory and how their grandma made the food for them and they loved it and this and that. And then at the bottom, they just have the uh, yeah, so Google claims that all that fluff content doesn't help with rankings, even though the first page of Google is completely covered with cooking sites that have a shit ton of content I don't care about and not just the recipe. Uh, Google claims that that doesn't help at all. So that's it for the SEO news. There you go. <laughs>
It's all lies and deceit. Lies I, and deceit. I got a I got a little update. Duck oh, Duck Go yeah. has a mapping solution now. Oh. They have a local an alternative to Google Maps, supposedly. Um Duck Duck Go Maps. Oh, wow. like, duck, duck, go. I can dig it. Looks like it's built on the back of uh, Apple Maps platform or whatever that base, that software, but but not Apple Maps. It's DuckDuckGo, and I guess they have their own ranking oh. algorithm. And dun, 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 dun. So, so who yeah. owns them? Do you know who DuckDuckGo is? I have no idea. No idea. I thought it was someone we know. But that now becomes another platform that if you're doing local, possibly try to get listed on, right? You want to try to get your your clients listed everywhere in that local ecosystem. Now you have DuckDuckGo maps to worry about. Um, so we'll, we'll probably- I feel like you guys might know who owns DuckDuckGo because it's based out of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah, I just saw that. I never even looked into them before. So I've, I've looked into it once before and I was like, man, I, like they're- I feel like they were somewhere nearby or something, but no, they're pretty far away from us, actually. So. I don't know Pennsylvania geography. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. That's why I'm Google mapping it right now. What else? So what do we got in the news here? We have a lot of fun John Mueller comments that are maybe roasting them. Uh, yeah, man. So the uh, analytics thing or the, the, the association thing up in search console, they had some of that previously. Uh -huh. They had analytics and they had your ad account i think um some of this other stuff looks like it's new that actually used to and still might help when you connected everything um and that website is the one that you list on like a, a, a an unclaimed or a new gmb listing but you have all of your all your stuff connected in google analytics and search console interconnected um that actually helped for me, multiple times trigger like instant verification on listings on brand new Google or GMB listings. So, um, but now it looks like there's even more like you can hook up YouTube, play console, all types of stuff. So um, that's interesting. But see how many people want to go out there and try to trigger some instant verifications on brand new GMB listings. Take your website, verify it in search console, connect your uh, connect your analytics and verify it there. Connect both of those together, then go and see if you get the option to instantly verify it. Seems like certain categories, it's a lot easier to do. Um, and possibly certain metro areas too. It looks like certain really big cities. Um, I don't know. That's, I don't want to get in too detail there. But <clears throat> anyway. There's Chaz making his fake GMBs. No, yeah. I do not do that. I'm just, I have some knowledge from. That's what I'm, it's too easy to go get somebody that has a legit That's address and get do a postcard. You yeah. know what I mean? Like everybody wants to go around and do a PO box or buy something from UPS. And it's like, for what? They're going to do a giant sweep and they'll eventually knock you off the listing eventually. Like they know, you know, they're getting smarter about that. So, uh, but I will say that the postcard thing is kind of BS right now because it's hit or miss. Either they'll mail it right away or it's lost in the Bermuda Triangle somewhere. Yeah. You know, believe it or not, I don't I, I'm not really involved in like black hat map spam or like generating mass listings or anything. I know some of the methods and stuff, but I'm not personally like in all honesty, I used to be a little. A little, but I mean, I made maybe one or two listings probably in the past few months, but for testing, honestly, I think it's the only reason I've made listings yeah. recently yes. was just for testing. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't made like a listing for SEO or lead gen purposes for like three, two years. I just want to see if I can claim an unclaimed listing sometime. Like if I could build my <laughs> local guide account up high enough where I could just capture it, you know what I mean? And take Sometimes it over. I just want to um, test it. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it's possible because, uh, Chase Reiner actually had his GMB hijacked a while back and they posted it on. I mean, they did him dirty. I, I know if put you, some I bad know. stuff in there about his mom on there and everything, bro. It was I heard about crazy. Some hijack methods that was going, that was actually going around. That was being taught to people. Yeah. Well, you know, I wouldn't want to do it to one of my competitors to rattle their cage. But like, if you see one that's been sitting there, it looks like it's been there for a couple of years, just, and it's in your niche, just see if you can claim it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going that far. <laughs> Jeez. I, 
Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm totally curiosity is stricken me. It's, uh, it's really stricken me in that. I, I, I'm not black hat at all. I'm completely white hat. I actually have a white hat laying around my office somewhere that I put on. <laughs> not a dunce hat. Um, no, it might be a dunce hat. I don't know, but <laughs> I got to just make that statement publicly. I'm not involved in map spam. I'm not associated. <laughs> uh, just who knows? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, we, do, we do local seo like for clients in general that's like our business so yeah it's really not we don't do ppl or affiliate or anything so there's really no use for map spam unless i guess we did it for a client but yeah. I've, i see i've done that for clients too and like if they understand that they're going to get like blown up with calls for maybe a couple months and then it's going to stop like okay but it's not a good client a good client uh lead gen method you know because they're going to be upset when those hundreds of calls just stop overnight. <laughs> like there was, exactly. there was a couple of things in here you wanted to talk about too. What, what was that? There was. A um, well, I mean, first of all, if we just look at some of John Mueller's comments about number of links being irrelevant, like John Mueller makes so many blanket statements that it's just ridiculous. Same with the the penalty for redirects. I have seen certain redirects cause issues with google and maybe it wasn't because it was in the algorithm maybe because it was literally like a bug or hit some kind of issue um but john's not going to tell me that put sending a google bot through 50 redirects isn't going to shift things a little bit or like they're not going to just stop bouncing through hundreds of redirects to find the pick come on john i mean seriously yeah so um oh and talking about not announcing depreciated ranking signals going back to I think it was Dustin who was saying in the beginning talking about people who kind of do the same stuff that we did in like 2010 you know for SEO um there's actually a lot of people who have like really firm beliefs in some of those old old concepts like they're they're convinced that that is like the heart of SEO um but yeah I would I would wonder I, I often wonder how much Google has changed since the beginning to where certain things just don't even exist anymore. Where like John mentions, I think in this article I was reading that um, uh, certain things, like even though they may not be depreciated, like the page experience is just gonna make like a lot of old algorithms kind of outdated, right? It's gonna replace those because, you know, things are better and whatnot, so. Anyways, that was my comments on that. Um, I thought there was something else here I wanted to comment on. Mobile first indexing. You want the you the recipe thing? I know you were. Oh the oh yeah okay okay yeah that's right. So first of all yeah so John Mueller is claiming that having a bunch of content on your site that's relevant to your topic even though it may not be directly related to the intent that, that you would think would be there, doesn't help SEO, right? Like if you search uh, any like, you know, roast chicken recipe or something online right now, I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna put chicken recipe. I it's wanna like see. known amongst cooking bloggers to do that though. Cause I, I went to a conference for Mediavine, one of the ad networks and Everyone there, every cooking person is talking about how it works for them. Yeah, you gotta you gotta have the infographic too, right? You gotta have the infographic, and then there's usually three or four ads you have to scroll past to get oh, to the, the recipe. The ones that right. go over the whole screen, like, and it's like monetization is horrible on those cooking websites. Like the the user experience is just shot, shot. So just because, like, I honestly I search recipes online all the time. Like that's like my go to um, for recipes. Like I, I don't even know why recipe books exist anymore. I feel sorry for anybody that's trying to start a recipe blog. Like it must be, you have to be really niched down for it to even have any success. So there, the, I actually saw that, like I, I bookmarked this bad boy right here. I'm going to throw it in the comments, just the recipe app for anyone who doesn't know about this. If you go to any recipe blog and take their link and drop it in that website, it strips out everything, but just the ingredients and the directions from their, from their page. And you can go and click through to there. So yeah, that's, um, now here's the thing though, which I, I thought was kind of interesting is, 
So if you go to that website, just the recipe, and you put in, say, someone's um, URL, it'll actually, it creates like a URL on their site. Um, I don't think they're indexed, though. But technically, that would be more relevant than the actual post, according to what Google is saying, I believe, right? Yeah. Like, that would be, that would be just the facts, that having just the directions and the ingredients would rank better than having a thousand words of how, where you first learned about the recipe. But that's not the case. So, well, I mean, it's a recipe. So if you don't have some kind of context there, it's going to look like a lot like it. If you had a, all your website was like that. I mean, we already know Google doesn't really reward really thin content, right? Like it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't take rocket science to know that, right? Well, um, you're in the crypto space too. Imagine like coin market cap versus the other ones. Like if you have just a ticker up of all the coins, that's like Google saying, hey, putting a bunch of information about those coins and things on that page doesn't help SEO. Right. How are you going to say that about a rest? Like a recipe site is kind of the same thing. It's 99%. I mean, I could see if it was just, if you were like looking at, you, if you Google search Bitcoin price and all it was, was that data on that page, mm -hmm. you can definitely rank for that. You, But you know, Google's not going to just rank any website. It's it's going to go after something that does have a high authority in that, in that, that field. But again, if you're just Google searching Bitcoin price, then yeah, you could probably have a ticker on there with the price and a few other metrics and maybe 200 words worth of content and it would rank, right? But if someone um, puts 800 words in a ticker, they'll outrank you. Generally, if it's more relevant, like that's what we're seeing with these these recipe sites. Like the more right. content, the better. And Google's saying that bloated. bloated well, I definitely think that it does help, but then there's other SEOs that think, well, the, the first ranking article is 2,000 words, so I'm going to one-up him and write a 4,000-word article. And that right there is a quick way to waste a lot of time in writing fluff that the reader's just going to be, they're not going to engage with it, right? Like it's just- I don't want rank as well either. Yeah. Sometimes more words aren't <laughs> what you need, right? Like- most people, because like a lot of people get in that habit, they're like, oh, the top ranking ar article is a 1500 word. So if I write a 3000 word or a 10,000 word, the most comprehensive epic guide ever known to man, let me get that out there, right? That I'm going to outrank them. And it's like, well, maybe not. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's a fine balance. Um, maybe if he was talking about parody, he would be right. Like if, to go outside of parody, the bloat is not helpful to SEO, but he's, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just think he's like, he, he confuses the issue so much. Right. And th what Dustin says is exactly right. Like it, it's, it's that extra bloat there beyond the 1500 words that the top guy has, that that is the bloat that doesn't help you. But to right. say, you're going to do it with zero words when the top ranking guy has 1500, that's, Right. As long as you're on parity, then yeah, bloat, bloat doesn't help. But right. Uh, but that's such a send off, man. Like, you know, how many people are going to read that and be like, oh, I, I don't need content. I don't need more content. I, I just need what the what the person's looking for. And then Google can figure it out from there. <laughs> and to their point, they may in some regard kind of rank, but it's going to take Google probably longer to test that article because then they kind of have to figure out what it's about. And, and I feel like you just, you need more context, but if, if the top ranking article has 800 words on there, then, you know, you probably should be somewhere between six and 800 words of additional content on that paper. Um, yeah. Because I do think that you do get dinged for having thin content. If you get a bunch of pages with really thin content, you're never going to get traffic to that website. Just it's not going to happen. Um, not on its own, at least. Right. You could dump some gasoline on it, maybe get some links going to it. But yeah, that's my good thought. Point. awesome stuff. What are, we got to wrap it up pretty soon, though. Yeah, oh, this, was, this was a long episode. This was this was a good episode. Well, every episode is great. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid we'll, if we make it too long, we start losing viewership at, at, at the end. So um what do you what do we think maybe wrap it up here i'm yeah i think i'm pretty good i don't see any big questions or anything um 
we could always ask uh, if there's anything we could always answer them next week so if you have any additional questions throw them in the comments we can start there next week instead of wait until the end too so absolutely put your questions there for next week if we didn't get to them we will we'll get to them um <clears throat> dustin thanks for coming on thank really you really enjoyed it uh, you brought great conversation um thank you uh to tell everybody about your sites and where they can learn some more info expect i, I want to check out your crypto miner site too what's the url on that yeah so it's going to be crypto miner tips.com is for the the cryptocurrency mining website and then uh for our agency it's leadkia.com so very nice kind of like ikea but lead kia right so anybody um make sure everybody go check out dustin's uh dustin's uh, sites give them some love there get them some traffic going um yeah. <laughs> you were the one who was asking about your logo in one of the groups and you gave like three or four different options for your agency yeah. i answered that <laughs> did he, he go that feedback seriously did he, he go with your answer sophie yes he did awesome Look it at looks that. great <laughs> All right. Awesome. And Sophie, uh, first episode, thank you for coming on as a co-host. It was great. Uh, we're going to make this part of the part of the show. We're going to have a little segment all about agency growth and, and stuff like that. So thank you for coming on. Um, Mike, as usual, thank you. Um, everybody watching, thanks for watching. Uh, episode 77 of the SEO Vault. You can catch replays on YouTube. Uh, we have a podcast, the SEO Vault. Download us, take us with you. Um, make sure you're on that email list. Get registered for the Webby. All that stuff's you know happening very very soon. So, thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll we'll see you next week, Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. See us. Bye. Bye.